Okay, let's work an example. So this example says, the Donwall Corporation issues a bond today at par. Right? Now, again, uh, we've got a lot of terminology in this chapter and the next one that's going to be different. Um, and so the ways to uh, read, this, uh, read this sentence in sort of plain English is to know that issue in financial markets means to sell. So if you issue a bond, you are selling a bond. Um, and par is the par value or the face value. Okay. So if we were to repeat this uh, first sentence in plain English, it would say the Donwell Corporation sells a bond today for its face value. The stated coupon rate of this bond is 6% and the time until the bond matures is five years. What is the present value of the bond? Okay. Now we know that the present value of anything or the value of anything is the present value of its future cash flows. And so I think it helps, uh, and you guys will have recognized this by now, just to give ourselves a little timeline of those future cash flows so that we can sort of understand what the present value of the future cash flows look like. So we have a few future cash flows here. Right? We have a bond maturing in five years, so we're going to have five years of future cash flows. And the cash flows for a bond are the coupon, which is the interest payment, and the return of the principal, which is the face value payment. So we have a coupon rate of 6% per year. Okay, so this is an annual bond. And we figure out the coupon payment by calculating the par value or the face value. times the coupon rate. And since the par value is always a thousand, that's simply gonna be a thousand dollars times our coupon rate. Here's 6%. So the coupon payment is $60 per year. Okay. So then our cash flows are gonna look like this. We're gonna have a coupon of $60 every year for five years, the five remaining years of uh, maturity, so the five remaining years of life. And then at the end of the fifth year, we are going to get our face value back, the return of our principal of our loan, uh, $1,000. So we have six future cash flows that we need to uh, take the present value of uh, in order to get the total value or the price, right? Present value is also, uh, equivalent to price. So what is the price of the bond is the present value of the future cash flows. Now, luckily we don't have to do much here. This is something we're already familiar with because this is simply an annuity combined with a, a single lump sum future value. So we have an annuity because we have five level cash flows and they don't go on forever. All right, so level cash flows don't go on forever. This part of the cash flows is an annuity. Then we have a separate problem, which is just the present value of $1,000 received five years in the future, a single lump sum problem. And we can combine those two and we can do it in the calculator in one easy step. Right? So we can say we have a future value of $1,000 we also have a payment of $60 per year. In is always going to be our remaining maturity. And we're given that straight off in the problem. There are five years remaining to maturity. IY is our yield to maturity. This is always going to be our yield to maturity or YTM. Okay, so this is not the coupon rate or it is not necessarily the coupon rate. There are some cases where it is. Um, and the only case where it is the coupon rate is the day the bond is issued.
So on the day the bond is sold, the yield to maturity is equal to the coupon rate. But at any other point in time, the yield to maturity can fluctuate where the coupon rate cannot fluctuate. Because remember, this is a contract, a, a bond is a contract. So the coupon rate is written into the contract and it is fixed forever. So no matter how the yield to maturity changes over time, the coupon rate won't. So they're only going to be equivalent on one day. And because we're told that the bond is sold today, this happens to be one of those days where the yield and the coupon are the same. Uh, and so our, our IY here is 6%. Now, we compute the present value and we get negative 1,000. Okay. Now, does this make sense? And what we have to think about is what this question is actually asking, right? And in some ways, um, the answer here was given straight off in the problem because it says the Don Wall Corporation sells a bond today for its face value. Think about what a bond is. What this transaction actually is, is a loan. And the way a loan works is I today I provide the loan to the company. They in turn promise to pay me interest payments over time and then return the principal, the amount of my loan at the end of the loan life. So the transaction for a bond will always look like this. On the day the bond is issued, we will pay $1,000 for the bond because that's its par value, its face value. That's what we're loaning the company. They will then pay us $60 per year and return our $1,000, right? So on the day the bond is issued, this is exactly how the transaction is intended to work. Remember, it's a loan. On any other day, the price and the yield to maturity might fluctuate uh, in the market. And, uh, and so this, uh, this is only true on the day the bond is issued. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, how that works, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the interest rate in the market and, and how these things are set, okay? So again, let's imagine that we're sitting here today, right, today in 2020, and we have Google, and they want to issue a bond, So they have to decide a few things. They have to decide how much money they want to raise in total. They have to decide, right, so how much they want to borrow. They have to decide how long they want to borrow it for, what the maturity is going to be. And then they have to try and decide what the appropriate interest rate is, right? So they say, let's say they want to borrow money for five years. So they want a maturity of five years. and they want to raise, let's say a full billion dollars, one billion dollars, right? Uh, but we know that they'll do this in, uh, this is gonna happen in, um, in bonds with a face value of a thousand. So to raise a billion dollars, they're gonna to have to sell one million bonds uh, with a face value of $1,000 each. And they're gonna to promise to borrow the money and repay it in five years. And the question for us is, how do they choose, how, how, does, how do we arrive at the interest rate that gets charged? How does Google decide what the coupon that they're gonna pay? And the answer is, is they look to the market interest rate. All right, so let's look at the market interest rate. And again, this is a little bit of hand wavy here. I, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail because that's not what this class is about. But in general, we would say that market rates fluctuate cyclically, which means they go up and down and up and down and up and down. So imagine that this is a graph of the interest rate in the market. Right now, it's really low, right? About 2%, about as low as it's ever been. But 
Ultimately, as the market improves, the rates will climb and then we'll have another downturn and another upturn. And if we went back into the past, we would see that rates had climbed uh, and then were low again back in the uh, 2008 crisis. So in general, we see that rates move cyclically in a cycle like this. Okay? And the way that a coupon rate for a bond today is determined is that Google would go to the market and they would look for the market rate and they would say, okay, today in 2020, let's call that rate one per one and a half percent. So they'd say in 2020, today's rate is 1.5%. And so Google is gonna issue their bond with a 1.5% uh, coupon rate. Okay, so they're gonna issue a five-year bond with a 1.5% coupon rate, and, uh, and that's today. So today, the yield, the market rate, right, and the market rate, the required rate, the yield to maturity, those are all the same, they're all equivalent. So today, the market rate or the yield to maturity is set or, or, or rather is equal to the coupon rate because on the day the bond is issued, the coupon is chosen to be the market rate that's available. Okay? Now in the future, we know that the market rate is gonna change and it's gonna change for lots of other reasons that are outside of Google's control. In other words, there's gonna be broader market implications that move the market rate and Google won't have any power over that. And so, it may be the case that say we get to, what's this, 2027, right? And so let's call that, oh no, 2028, 2028. So let's say uh, in 2028, the market rate is now 8%. because hopefully by then the market has improved, rates have climbed, and if uh, Google wants to raise more money. Right. They wanna raise more money, They've already paid back their old loan, right? 2020, they paid back their old loan in 2025. In 2028, they wanna raise more money. But now they, again, set the coupon to be equal to the current market rate. So their new bond will have a coupon of 8% which of course is much better for investors, right? but uh, much worse for Google. Okay. Now, we could see that this would, um, given, that, given that the old bond has already expired, Google doesn't have another choice uh, and neither do investors. But let's say that Google wanted to uh, raise more money here in 2024. Right? So in 2024, there old bond still exists, right? The market rate is now 4%, but Google is still paying at its existing investors 1.5% because the coupon rate is written into the contract, so it never changes. So even though the market rate has gone up to 4%, and if Google wanted to borrow more money in 2024, it would need to pay 4%. But even though that's the case, they, they have locked in a contract where they get to pay a much better rate. And investors have in turn been locked into a contract where they have to receive this rate. So even though the yield, the, the market rates have gone up, the coupon rate has stayed fixed. And what this means is that it's made the 2020 bond that only pays one and a half percent a very unattractive investment, simply because any new bond, let's say Apple sells a bond in 2024. They're gonna do it at a 4% coupon in 2024. Which means that an investor can now buy a bond from Apple making 4% in 2024 
and would have no desire to uh, say buy one of the existing bonds from Google that only pays one and a half percent. So if I was one of the original Google bond buyers, but I for some reason needed some of my money back and I tried to sell my bond in the open market, I tried to sell it to a new investor, I would have a very unattractive uh, proposition to make because what I would be saying is, listen, I've got this bond uh, that's gonna give me a one and a half percent coupon and then it'll pay me back my face value uh, in a couple of years. And uh, everybody else will say, why would I wanna buy the Google bond at one and a half percent when I can buy an Apple bond today for the same price that pays 4%? And the answer is, of course, we wouldn't do that. No one would want to pay for that. And the only way that this transaction can actually occur, that someone could sell a one and a half percent bond at the point in time when the market is paying 4% on any new bonds is for them to drop the price of the bond, okay? And so this illustrates sort of the, um, one of the fundamental rules of finance uh, and, uh, and one of the things that I hope you leave from the class, which is that uh, prices and interest rates move in opposite directions. So as interest rates climb, prices fall because the old options, the old contracts that were written are now less attractive because new contracts have better interest rates. So the prices of the old contracts must fall to compensate investors. On the other hand, as interest rates fall, prices of old contracts rise because someone who got a 2028 bond paying 8% has a much more attractive option than someone in say 2030 who's only making 7% or someone in 2036 making only say 2%. Okay, so as interest rates fall, prices of older contracts rise. And so we say that prices and interest rates have an inverse relationship. They move in opposite directions.